Crystal Tire Information Whiskey, 21530. Wind, 060 at 5. 06, Mike Juliet, this is Arch Radar Contact. SRS Weather Information from Minnesota, available on flight service frequency. You've dialed in the Flying Midwest Podcast. Connecting aviators from across America's heartland. Sharing news, information, and events from around the region. Sit back, relax, and join our crew for some hangar talk as we discuss a wide variety of regional aviation topics. And now, from our home at the Anoka County Blaine Airport, our checklist is complete and we're ready for departure for another episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. Welcome everyone to another very special episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. We are recording live just outside the world's busiest control tower and we're joined today by one of the controllers here at Oshkosh. He's known as TH at work. Uh, TH, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, so you're one of the the controllers that works all the planes into Air Venture, and so we're happy to have you here. And we start all of our interviews out with what we call the Fast Five, and it's just sort of a lighthearted, rapid fire, spur of the moment, top of the head type of questions. And so we'll hand it over to Jim for the Fast Five. Oh, thank you, Badger. Um, and by fast, we mean how fast you're probably controlling traffic. So um, <laughs> we get some we get some Piper Cup slow answers sometimes. So yeah, we're used to you, talking fast. Yeah, here, you can. So. I mean, you can expand a little bit, but um, anyway. Uh, first question, favorite plane you've seen at AirVenture? And it doesn't have to be just this year. Well, the, this year, for sure, the the B-52. Okay. Uh, watching that come in on a relatively <laughs> short runway is always uh, impressive. <laughs> and it popped the chute and everything. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that was cool. Is yeah. that your top number one of all time? Uh, that's tough to say. I mean, I, I think, it, at least when I fly, it, my favorite airplane is the one I just got out of. So, you know, we <laughs> like them all. But, yeah, we do get a large variance. Especially the Burt Rattan, you yeah. know, funny looking things, you know, oh, they, sure. they're always like, how does that fly? And I don't even know what the name of the one that we saw, it's like, looked like a little tube that had two vertical fins on either side with a super stubby wing. Uh, it was a pusher. Uh, we thought it was a jet at first from the tower and they're like, okay, it's, it's not a jet, but we, we didn't know what it was. So. Hmm. Stubby wing. I mean, was it the Starship that came in? No, much okay. smaller. It was like a two seater oh. tandem. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, There's I don't a know lot either, of them. But, but it, <laughs> this first time like, I've seen it, it's like, okay. It feels like a trip to Boeing Plaza later to see if we can figure oh, out yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah. All right, question number two. Best kept secret of air venture? Uh, I don't know. Cheese curd tacos? Or? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great answer. I still that's a good have, answer. I haven't explored those yet, but I think that today might be the day. Today may be the day. Uh, we, I went to the stall, competi- or the stall performance uh, last night, and uh, that was my first time finally getting over there. That's... That's such a sub community uh, yeah. in just pure aviation. You know, it's mm-hmm. it, I, I just enjoy from the kind of the bottom of the guys, you know, with ga- uh, one gallon of gasoline flying the par- par- parachutes to the jet teams, everything else. I mean, from A to Z, there's everything, you know, RC airplanes. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> did you see the black flies buzzing around then yesterday, last night? Um, I did not. I think it was after the stole competition. I just, I heard them and I'm like, they're here. Okay. You guys I saw know the, the hot the air balloons. Ones oh, uh, the hot air balloons? I don't know if they got airborne, but I think they did a presentation. So, yeah. Sweet. Everything. Sorry, I'm kind of hijacking your password. <laughs> <laughs> I've got questions. No, you're fine. <laughs> uh, question number three. Worst weather experience of your adventure? I think I, I, I was here when I was not a pink shirt, and I, it, was, it was the year of the Cub. I think it was like 12 or 13, uh, and we had the, like a straight wall storm you know wall cloud come through and it knocked every port of john and the entire oh, place geez. down <laughs> i was over in the neck no. tent, uh you know saying hi and i think we had like five or six people hanging on to the the poles so the tent wouldn't blow away and <laughs> and, and then the flood that uh you know ensued afterwards mm. um, air, air traffic wise uh you know we we tend to stay on top of it a little bit so sure. um the, they they will go in the hold or push people away if we get some severe weather like that so okay Question yeah. number four. Favorite food or beverage on the grounds? Uh, we said uh, This might yeah. be a repeat answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, I really got to check those out today. Don't let me forget. I know. I, I want one. <laughs> so we're one. doing it. I, I, one's good. Just one you, is good? Yeah, I don't know if you need yeah, more than that. But I yeah. won't push oh, it. <laughs> my poor little Midwestern heart won't be able to take the cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the last question for the Fast Five is, if you could meet anyone in aviation, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, Bob, Ho- Bob Hoover. Bob yeah. Hoover. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I remember go, going to the Dayton Air Show. Yeah, I'm from the Midwest and and seeing his I think my solo looked a lot like his act <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah what a what an ambassador for aviation and, and seeing the you know the skill and the talent just yeah. very low key you know as long as your first solo didn't look like Kyle Franklin's you're probably <laughs> <awesome. laughs> got a great show but man he's got a, it's, it's so it's good got to take a lot of skill to fly that bad mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> alright well thanks for playing along with our fast five questions we're going to jump into the interview now all Maddie. right. So, what got you into aviation first? Uh, well, f- at first, it was just seeing the airplanes. My dad was a pilot. Okay. Uh, my Aunt Rose, as you know, and John are pilots. And, um, you know, I, I was just fascinated by the ability to get airborne and, and the view. And I think I was hooked from my first little little flight around Ohio. And um, ever since then, I knew I wanted to be a pilot. And from there, you know, it was kind of professional side or not. Um, which I, I went the ATC route, which I, you know, been, it's been a great career. But the flying, I still enjoy for fun. And I was, sure. I, I always thought that if I, I went the other way, it would, it would kind of lose the, the magic of it, so to speak. But, sure. Uh, and I like being home every night. Yeah. So. <laughs> that is that is nice. So what got you into air traffic control specifically? Uh, well, I was actually job shadowing. I think in middle school it was a uh, American Airlines captain. Oh. Uh, and. Uh, he uh, had the wisdom and the kind of foresight to kind of predict what was happening, you know, in the, the early 2000s to the airlines and mm. the consolidation and, and uh, the mergers. Uh, and he suggested this other, right? You know, he's like, hey, you know, you can be home every night, do this air traffic thing, kind of explain the history of um, uh, the strike and the firing of a large amount of air traffic controllers. Yeah. And, you know, fast forward 20 or 30 years, there was going to be a mass exodus out of that job, which would make a mass hiring. Uh, sure. And in my graduation right around 9-11, and then I did uh, a control uh, in the U.S. Navy for, for five years. Okay. And so it was either that or college. And, and it, of course, that, that story was 9-11, right? So I went yeah. to the military route. Uh, proud to serve there and then following that i just walked right into you know where the agency had a ton of job openings okay um so that's that's kind of was the story on that what i would say the institute of that was i was really still airplanes you know the whole way and then uh i think, I think it was a like a it was boy scouts or young eagles they got a tour of the the fort wayne tower where you know i grew up and i was i was hooked from that point uh, you know, I was like, oh, instead of flying one airplane, I can, you know, fly 10, you know, sure. at the same time. Sure. <laughs> and uh, kind of rub shoulders with those guys and just made it seem very feasible. And this is the, you know, before Google, before whatnot. So I just read a couple books on it and this and that. And so I knew really from middle school, that that's exactly what I wanted to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Super cool. So with all of those openings, when you started, was it pretty easy to get basically where you wanted to work? Because you ended up pretty close to home then right can you tell yeah, us where you were my first uh, facility i hired in uh, into indianapolis uh tower and trick on um and so the hiring has changed you know every year you know the you know back then you, know, you met the manager and suit and tie and and kind of introduce yourself you did the interview that and then you know they just you know changed the process now and i'm not totally familiar with it being in the agency now but it's more centralized now I, I, the last I last I heard, I think the last bid had forty or fifty thousand applicants. Oh. So that was not the case when when I was going through. We were just kind of unknown, you know. I think there was not a lot of media out there about that job. So we were kind of the unknown, you know, force behind the the frequency. Sure. Um, so. And you mentioned you're at a, a Tower Tracon, so you're certified on both local and radar then, right? Yeah, so as you know, there's probably th- three different uh, types of facilities. There's Towers, tra- uh, Tracons, Terminal Radar Approach Controls, and Centers. Uh, mm-hmm. Indianapolis does Tower uh, in the immediate vicinity, uh, about five miles of the airport. And then uh, we, we own about 60 miles of airspace, up to 13,000 feet. 
uh, you know, in central Indiana. Um, so you mentioned you did this in the military as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. It was a controller uh, in the Navy uh, Tower and uh, radar radar final or GCA. Uh, the, the at least where I was at, they did more GCA approaches, like single frequency approaches, okay. getting aircraft to land. Not the full approach control service. Uh, when I went to the uh, obviously the FAA, that's that was when I got my first approach ticket. So how are those kind of different? How are those experience different? What let's. Well, in the military, okay, so you're, uh, you're, I mean, you're military first, you know. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, I had some friends that did controlling the whole time. Sometimes they were assigned to other details. But uh, um, the military, you know, much like our brotherhood that we have, you know, months aviation or the NACA members, you know, it, it is it is definitely a team. And that's mm-hmm. that's one of my favorite aspects of coming here to Air Venture is, is the team aspect, you know, because it's, during the peak times not one controller can do it and there's just too much to see there's too much to say there's the situational awareness where one voice uh is too much and so that team aspect um, is really highlighted here at air venture so speaking of air venture um before we get into like the the tower and the operations side of it prior to working air venture how many years have you been coming to the event uh, prior to, I, I don't know, at least uh, three or four years, I, you know, I, I flew up, you know, uh, in a Cutlass one time. I flew to Fond du Lac, it, you know, as a newer pilot, and and uh, gosh, I can't three or four times probably been up here. Okay. Yeah. And then as a controller, how does that work? To is it like a selection process, or do you have to express interest? How does it work to get into working at Air Adventure? Yeah. So all the air traffic controllers, the, uh, the pink shirts as we call them, are uh, you know FAA controllers. Uh, uh, this is a Midwest tower, I believe. So they're federal contract towers. Okay. Um, so the FAA, when the NOTAM hits, uh, it's, we bring people largely from the Midwest, uh, some as far as Texas or uh, other areas if they don't feel that. Um, and they, yeah, there's a national agreement, national MOU, uh, to kind of keep everything fair and people apply apply for it. And if your facility can release you, uh, that's probably the biggest hurdle for any controllers wanting to get out is, you know, get, getting released. Sure. Um, and if you can get released, then then they follow that process. So how did you make the decision to come to apply and to work at Osh? Oh, this was a this was an easy decision. <laughs> I said for for me, uh, you know, this is this has been a really a joy and a, and a privilege to come in and and you know work with some of the finest air traffic controllers in the country uh, in a fun volunteer event. Um, and and just see the whole spectacle from top to top to bottom. It's 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 a lot of fun. So yeah, I've always wanted to do this. Ever I was outside the district for some time, I was at center for some time, you know. So now when I when I came back to Indianapolis uh, Tower, it's like I, you know I'm going to put in as soon as I can. So so what does the training process look like then? Once you're selected to come and work at AirVenture. The training process at, at Osh, uh, Oshkosh. Yep, at Oshkosh. Yeah, so they do. We do. Everybody has a training day. Uh, we all get temporary uh, CTOs, um, and I just take an opportunity to remind everybody. This is, you know, just my opinion and what I've seen. Sure. Uh, not the unions or or the agencies, but again, my perspective. We're seeing, uh, you know, a very thorough uh, uh, training time, and then not just the training day, but the tr- entire training process. You know, you guys have probably heard the term r- rookies or limiteds or veterans. Yep. You know, so it, it's a team process. You're kind of you know, moved along and you have different expectations, um, throughout the process. So your rookies, you know, they're just kind of, kind of drinking through a fire hose a little bit the first year and soaking it up and learning what they can and your limiteds and then your veterans. And then, and then also the team leads, you know, those, those are the guys that have been there and seen it all and, sure. and, uh, can take command of the team. And so that, that training process is over the years, just proven to be, you know, a giant safeguard, um, Again, that team aspect is too much for at times for one controller. So mm-hmm. you kind of lean on everybody's roles and responsibilities, you know, on the tower team. So that leads nicely to the next question, which is what are the different positions or roles and specifically how does that team mentality play into each one? Well, everything we do is a team. And so you have the immediate uh, team, you know, uh, and then you have the tower team as a whole from the frontline managers to the operation managers in the back. And we work as a team with Fisk. You know, we're in constant contact with Fisk. We're in constant contact with Fond du Lac. You know, if we're holding, like earlier this week, the, the warbird pattern got 
you know, so the holding panner got so large that we ended up using uh, their Delta down to Fond du Lac. Okay. Um, so, it, and everything that we do as a team, whether it's, you know, it's the tech ops or the managers, uh, and then the immediate team, you know, we have different roles. So if you're, you're on the right base, you're on the left base, or the communicator, uh, yet, uh, during those busy times, the communicator uh, likely is not even seeing the aircraft that they're communicating to. They're relying on their team member to their left or to their right or the team lead behind to change a plan if needed. Uh, and then the soups are t- talking to him like, hey, we have this situation. Or if we had to go around, your guys are going to take this guy around and move him over here or whatever. So it's it's constantly dynamic. The, you know, the, the team aspect makes that, that possible. And I think like even just like listening on like live ATC or something like that, I mean, there's a lot of talking happening just on that radio, but I got to imagine that at each of these positions, there's even more talking going on between the controllers to make that communication happen in the first place. Yeah, and if you listen to the audio, often you can hear like voices in the background. That that's a lot of what that's going on. I, you know, especially the left and right, and the guy behind you. We're making calls out, and you know you keep repeating those calls until the communicator uh, issues it. So okay, yeah. For those that have never been out to Fisk itself, can you explain kind of what that team process is with there's someone with binoculars talking in your ear and who's actually doing what? Yeah, so the Fisk, uh, it's a VFR arrival, VFR approach control is the only one that I know of. uh, And it's a very unique uh, Oshkosh only event. I I, I know some in Sun and Fun and some others have done similar things, but we've been doing it here for a long time. And you follow Mm -hmm. that procedure, uh, depending on what transition and what lake you start at, you follow inbound you know per the notum and we're transmitting you know 20 30 40 miles out to these aircraft that are not responding to us so as a controller it's a pretty unique uh thing uh with the addition of now adsb it is is heightened our awareness you know greatly prior to that it was uh you know kind of transmitting to the blind yeah so to speak Mm -hmm. um so, which it it still is, and we uh, as we transmit, we can see what the aircraft are doing, and and we can see where they're kind of getting stacked up, and so it's much more, you know, much more efficient, a lot safer, uh, much more organized than than it really ever has been. And so, if you're the communicator, you're the guy that's, you know, um, picking that you know aircraft a mile, half mile from Fisk, getting that wing rock that's so famous, and uh, with that acknowledgement. Uh, you want you want to make sure you're only talking to that one aircraft, uh, uh, not a guy you know five miles or six miles or whatever. Um, and so once you identify that aircraft, that's what that rock is for. Then you then you run them up the tracks to the northeast. You run them east on Fisk Avenue uh, for the three six or one eight. And um, as far as the the teamwork aspect of that, you know, it's it's a team effort to identify these aircraft. It's it's an unusual spot to identify aircraft. Most of us controllers are you know sitting high in the control tower, looking down yeah, on these yeah. airplanes mm-hmm. on the on, on the ground, or you know maybe a, a beam us you know airborne you know on a base or final. So we're now below the aircraft, and so it is a little bit tricky. Uh, I, I know a lot of these. Uh, uh, pilots take a lot of pride in, in the aircraft and we do not mean to insult anybody if it's a sling <laughs> or it's a Cirrus or uh, you know whatever uh, and uh, sometimes we'll just ask you know because we want to know you know what does it look like you know the, the moonies and the and the tail you know mm-hmm. from that you know you kind of have that straight tail reverse tail on the Mooney mm-hmm. uh, versus like a, a V-tail bonanza sure. trying to pick out those differences uh, you know every year it seems like it takes just an hour or two to kind of get comfortable <laughs> <laughs> like what is this plane and then we verify when they fly over so so do you just work one position for the whole week or do you rotate around with other controllers yeah so the the, the pink shirts we we work every every position you know fa- uh, fisk uh the tower or the moo cows um i actually had a pilot ask me a question this week you know they didn't know that the the local controllers, you know, for departure were on the MooCows. They, they could see the NOTAM uh, and they could see the frequency. But, yeah, you see the pink shirts at, at the runways. That's that's us working uh, working the traffic out there. Okay. Or if we're giving uh, runway crossings, it's the pink shirts out there uh, crossing the runways. Uh, so, yeah, we get a, we get a full view um, of what's, you know, from yeah, – and then same with Fond du Lac as well. So we, we do work – 
uh, every position at least once or twice a week. Okay. Do you have a favorite? Uh, whichever one's busy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> typical controller you know, answer. Yeah, right. Sorry to be uh, typical on that, but yeah, whichever one's busy, then that's I would say that's pretty normal for for us. We're here. We're here to uh, to work work traffic, and sure, uh, that's where we want to be. So yeah. Yeah, you mentioned even before we started recording, like the, the guys and gals that come out here, they're like the ball hogs. Like they want to be busy. They want to be in the thick of the work. So. Yeah, we're we're not here to put our our, our feet up, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Every now and then, uh, you know, we go to Fond du Lac and it's uh, it's relatively pretty slow, which is is a nice break. Uh, often it's needed. Uh, sure. You know, you uh, get pretty tired, and then you get out there and able to kind of decompress for a little bit. But uh, yeah, we're 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 here to work. You know, just like the guys flying in, they want they want to come in. Everybody's here for the the big event. So yeah, awesome. Yeah. Do you cycle through every hour or so like you would on a normal schedule or are things adjusted for this? It, it depends. I I can't really speak too much on that, but I know that oftentimes we'll, we will just be on for the day. Okay. It just depends. In the tower, the rotation is a little bit different, so they can set up uh, differently for – because, you know, you have the show times, you mm-hmm. have uh, the hard hard times, you know, to shut things off. So that, that will depend, uh, you know, for, if you're out at Fond du Lac for – is you know, you're just there for – your shift so. okay we've mentioned kind of the team approach um, from the beginning of this interview um do you stay with the same team all week then or are you like oh, assigned a group yeah or? absolutely okay. yeah and that's that's super important you know we we get to know each other yeah by, by by the middle of it or the end of it you know you're you're completing each other's thoughts and you know we we work together and the same hotel together we go to dinner together the you know everything you know we should you know if, if any of us gets an airplane airplane ride we try to do that together <laughs> you know which we encourage everybody out there we we do uh, like seeing it from your perspective i i personally haven't done the fisk arrival mm. oh really uh from the air and you know because sometimes i wonder like is it hard to find fisk because you know you know you, we often see guys down the line i don't know if they're getting anxious or they're having a hard time seeing it where exactly fisk is uh but uh yeah, those things are important. Big Ford has been, or Little Ford has been great to us, uh, as well as many of the others. Uh, we appreciate seeing that perspective because, uh, uh, unlike me, there are many controllers that are not pilots. Sure. Uh, and to see see that, to see the workload, mm-hmm. uh, to see how how difficult it really is, <laughs> like Rush Lake. Like I didn't know until a year or two ago. Like it's normally dry. Like. <laughs> oh, oh, really? So, yeah. So. I guess I didn't know that either. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Learn something new every day. Is that why it looks like that on the sectional chart then? I think so. I think yeah, so. kind of with those. Is dots it, on isn't there. it like a dot outline yeah. for yeah. it? So I don't know if like only in the spring it's wet. I don't. I don't. I don't know. But I've I've had people say like it's not really a lake. It's just a bed. Just sort yeah. of a of dirt. That yeah, yeah maybe a swamp. Yeah. <laughs> Before we continue with this episode, a quick word from those who make the podcast possible. As pilots, we know all about the challenges of battling grease, grime, and other junk that can accumulate on our aircraft, especially on the underside. That's where release comes in. It's tough on grease and grime, making the cleaning process as easy as spray, wait, and wipe. I've used it on my plane and it tackled those stubborn spots and crease marks with ease. And let's not forget about those bugs we tend to smash with our GA aircraft. With release, those stuck-on bugs don't stand a chance and remove them effortlessly, saving me time and elbow grease. What's even better is Release is non-corrosive, non-abrasive, and free of harsh chemicals, so it's safe to use in a variety of aircraft materials. But it's not just for your aircraft. Release is also great for home, cars, boats, and RVs. It's a versatile cleaner that gets the job done wherever you need it. Check out their full lineup today at releasecleaner.com. We are entering the peak of summer flying season, and that means it's time to upgrade your eyewear with flying eyes. These aviation-inspired sunglasses feature a sleek, durable, and impact-resistant design. Their gradient lenses are perfect for pilots, providing maximum ease in reading your instrument panel. Say goodbye to those headache-inducing gas station sunglasses that fit poorly with your headset. Flying Eyes is designed by pilots for pilots to ensure superior comfort. Enter code FLYINGMIDWEST10 for 10% off your next purchase at Flying Eyes. So, so I imagine then it's it's long days and working pretty hard and yeah. What, I mean, what uh, is a typical what, day look like? I mean, this year the weather has just been perfect. Yeah. You know, 
uh, just absolutely been perfect. You know, there are some years where, you know, it's in the 90s and <laughs> uh, just like everybody else, we're out, out in it while you're trying to pay attention and stay hydrated and and, and whatnot. But yeah, we our, our shifts do start, uh, you know, fairly early, you know, six o'clock. And and uh, and I think uh, the, everything shuts down by eight. So the, so there's a little bit of overlap there. We do debrief uh, and uh, kind of talk about there's always something to talk about you know the veterans and every, everybody learns something every day and so mm-hmm. we do debrief um just to keep getting better get get that team better make sure everybody's on the same page because there are many different ways to do you know do you do you extend a final or you know a downwind do you turn them inside I mean, many different ways same with fists the techniques like today i'm noticing we have a north wind i want to be careful that you know that that east west road is not getting pushed out mm-hmm. so yeah. you can do some of those things differently like when we turn them or ensure that those guys are staying over the road whatever it is it's just those little little things that really help the operation stay you know tip top Um, because it it doesn't take long particularly when you get busy to get too far out there over the lake shore where you start losing people yeah uh, or on three six that if that uh, base gets wide uh, it gets it's get pretty tough for the tower uh, bring back in Sure. So I have a question about Fisk itself. So this is the second year in a row where I've gone out and just kind of hung out there. But do you have any adequate... Ed, adequate? That's not the right word. But I'm making words up now. Um, adequate. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any suggested, like, adequate... I did it again, didn't Why I? Why are you doing... <laughs> etiquette. Etiquette. Yes. Etiquette. Etiquette. That's where bloopers are born. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what kind of etiquette do you suggest or treat bringing of people uh, coming to visit you guys out at Fisk? Oh, for the fist, yeah. We again, this is uh, just my personal opinion, but we do love we do love visitors. You know, we love uh, showcasing uh, the special activities that are going on. And Fisk is definitely a very special event uh, to see those aircraft just lined up visually. Uh, only one way communication towards the tail end, uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of people bring food. I, I, that's been a that's been a very <laughs> nice thing to have. And, and, and I was I think I was telling somebody, said, man, we're gonna have to find a veterans home or somewhere to donate some of this because you know between the cheese curd tacos and the <laughs> thirty boxes of donuts that we get and everything else, we have to uh, you know find find something more productive because uh, we <laughs> certainly don't need it. We we all tend to eat very well when coming to Wisconsin. <laughs> so. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the controllers, especially in the overlap, you know, those are great times to kind of talk to a pink shirt on the side. You know, the, obviously the guys that are working, you know, don't want to be distracted. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, especially the, the pink shirts on the side uh, when the, on that overlap time, or often we'll hang out afterwards and chat with a lot of pilots. You know, they, we have, I mean, it's an international presence here. You know, we love to be ambassadors to aviation. Oh sure. Um, and and kind of promote the the event and, and I ask questions you know we have uh, controllers we have questions also often mm-hmm. we'll ask them you know what does it look like that's how we found out about Rush Lake you know so I'm actually I keep saying this every year but next year is going to be the year I fly in the <laughs> air venture uh, but maybe for maybe it'll come true next year but do you have any tips for me or anybody for that matter that's uh, flying the Fisk arrival uh, for the Fisk arrival I obviously just read the note them and make sure you're prepared um i've even heard of guys like coming you know in the off season and and, and flying it uh um I, as a pilot myself you know i think you, you have to take a gauge of uh your proficiency mm-hmm. um and if you're maybe not totally sure on that proficiency you know that the month of july or june you go get in the plane do do some uh, right hand pattern stuff. You know, two seven is guaranteed to be a uh, right hand pattern, uh, and a fairly sure approach. I mean, where they're doing a power off one eighty or something like that. You know, just prepare yourself a little bit, and then familiarize yourself. You know, and you know, before I flew in, when I you know, I listened to you know YouTube and heard the controllers talk, and and we really try not to fly the airplane for you. But there are some times you know, where we need that separation. Where we'll, we'll, you, you hear the guys, you know, kind of landing on the green dot or. Or whatnot. So that's, you know, you, you want to be proficient uh, when you come here. Obviously, for safety reasons. Um, and, and if you, there are times where we will reach out to a pilot and be like, "Hey, talk to us." You know, we want if something's important. We do want to talk to you. Don't be afraid to key the mic. 
particularly if we're reaching out to you and say, hey, we need you to do this. I need to make sure we got this important instruction. Because sometimes, uh, you know, as you know, on the FISC, there are two altitudes. You know, if you're unable to yeah. do 90 knots, there, there is that exception for those guys that are higher and faster. Uh, but uh, reminder, <laughs> they have to descend, right? So, uh, so when we do have some that are, you know, high and low, you know, we have to be able to work that down. And so it, sometimes at important instructions, uh, we will we'll say, hey, talk to me. And don't be afraid to do that. And just like in, as a controller in any circumstance, you know, if you're a pilot and you're uh, not totally sure on an instruction, you know, before you do something, you know, double check it, maybe ask your co-pilot. Or if you need to, you, you know, feel free to key up and, hey, was, you know, is that for me? You confirm 36 left, 36 right. We don't want land on the wrong runway, mm-hmm. you know. No, we don't. Um, <laughs> and again, the proficiency thing, opposite direction, it's, you know, nobody wants to see that, you know, so right. just being aware um, of your location, being aware where, where you're heading, stuff like that. As a pilot, I know that, you know, especially you go to an airport with, you know, intersecting runways, you know, often you have that tendency, you're like, oh, there's a runway in front of me. <laughs> I'm going to land on that one because that's what I see. So <laughs> just <laughs> being aware of, of that, I think, is a big help. Sure. We don't necessarily, I just have a cur- question purely for my own curiosity. What is like the worst infraction you've seen and the fisk arrival slash coming in here in your years of controlling? Um, well, I mean, it's a VFR arrival, so I would just encourage people to remember that it's a VFR arrival, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. So, you know, if the field's IFR, you know, we don't, we don't do, uh, I, you know, IFR VFR ops here. So, you know, sure. you listen, make sure you're listening to the ATIS. Make sure you're aware with the, like, today we're really close. Yeah. I think I saw the beacon on the tower. It was when I, when was, I got here, yeah. And I, I, I just checked the weather. It was like showing, I think, 1100 broken. Yeah. Um, so, but I, and I'm hearing airplanes now. So, yeah. there you go. So, it looks like it, we went VFR. But yeah, if I, I, that, that happened my first year. I flew in and I ended up uh, diverting to uh, Fond du Lac. Oh. You okay. know, the field was IFR, it was like 900. Um, and, uh, you know, I held over a, like a satellite airport, you know, well to the south. It really wasn't improving much. I just, so I ended up uh, going, going to Fond du Lac and that's, uh, Fond du Lac is a fantastic airport to divert to. It's not uh, near as busy. It's a much more traditional, uh, setup. They do, we do have a temporary tower there and mm-hmm. it's a, it's a very safe out, you know, if you have something, you know, uh, something in, you know, mechanically going on with your airplane or you think you might be in, I think last year, I think we, we had a guy land in Beanfield, um, oh. which you, they were fine and everything, but you know, couldn't find out there. You ran out of gas. Oh, <laughs> Whoops. you know, we, uh, and we do hold, you know, we do hold, mm-hmm. you know, because you have a military flight that comes in and takes yeah. airspace or, yep. you know, somebody pops a tire or whatever the case is, you know, it's a mm-hmm. lot of planes to bring in. Um, and if we do extensive holding, we'll, we'll, we'll try to remind the pilots, Hey, Check your fuel. Want to divert? Go divert. You know, it's a, it's a as a pilot, yeah, and as a good, I don't want to ever see anything bad happen. And and sometimes the safest option is the safest option. You can land there, take a uh, a bus ride, a twenty minute bus ride, <laughs> right. and be at the show. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. and in on a on a Tuesday morning when it's cool, and there's not loading going on. If you really want to come in here, you know, take the bus back out there and come back in. Awesome. Great. Well, I think it's about time for our favorite question. Definitely. I'm excited. So, <laughs> what is your aviation unpopular opinion, either as a pilot or a controller? Again, just your opinion, not that of the agency <laughs> or your <laughs> union. <laughs> uh, uh, unpopular? I, I don't know. Uh, on the, on the controller side, uh, I guess I'd be a little bit an ambassador for the pilots and the controllers. Uh, the, has anybody ever heard of a kind of a grumpy controller? No, know, never. No, never. Never. No, never. 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 No. never. It's, uh, Only blue skies you know, and colors I, with all of On way. both ends, I, I really try <laughs> on the pilot side to be like, hey, let's have a little understanding. Uh, and then the, on the controller side, you know, like uh, maybe this guy needs one of these box of donuts or, you know, because <laughs> our schedules are tough. Our, oh, yeah. The fatigue is, is uh, you know, a thing. The, stre- the stress that we deal with, you know, and, and you know, it, it, it is tough. We, we, I, that is a little bit of a, a, a pet peeve of mine because uh, it does kind of bring things down a little bit. Uh, being uh, both pilot and controller, I, I see from both perspectives. And you know, when I get a vector, you know, I'm like, gosh, 
<laughs> I want to be direct, you know. <laughs> and then when I'm in the controller, I'm like, man, he really needs to be this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, grace on both sides. We, we both had the same goal. Um, yeah, so I encourage bo both the pilots and controllers to you know, sometimes take a step back and understand that it's not a perfect system. Uh, but if you, you know, of course, if you need something, you'll reach out. Yeah. Sure. And on the on the vector things, I, whenever I give tours or whatever, I do I do show pilots often that, you know, hey, this say it's a you know pretty drastic vector, maybe 20 degrees off your course, you know, uh, and if you're doing 120 knots and you're on that heading for 20 miles, then you're back. You know, the the mileage that you've gained is really, you know, like four miles, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it doesn't necessarily cost as much as you might might think. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, that's I, that's it. I don't uh, I don't have a lot of pet peeves. I know there's a, a lot of dynamics going on in the in the, the NAS right now, um, and uh, we're constantly growing. This is an exciting time to be involved in aviation. We have a turnover of both controllers and pilots. We have mm -hmm. a turnover of new technology. The drones are up and coming. Yeah, uh, space is exploding. Yeah, you know, so we have a lot of really interesting things going on in aviation. Agreed. Well, TH, we can't thank you enough for coming onto the podcast and talking to us a little bit about all things Fisk Arrival. And um, it was nice to actually meet you in person. I watched you work Fisk Approach last year, and we didn't even realize it until a few days ago. So <laughs> I didn't notice either. I was busy working. So. <laughs> yeah, he was doing his job. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, That's thanks awesome. again for coming on. Well, thank you, guys. Flight Chef 536, contact Minneapolis Center 132.35 today. Thanks so much for joining us on the Flying Midwest podcast. Until next time, podcast service terminated, Squawk VFR, frequency change approved. Good day.